Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Orbit Live event with two great fantasy authors. I'm really excited to have both Andrea Stewart and K.S. Filioso with us virtually tonight. Andrea Stewart is the author of The Bone Shard Daughter, which is out today in the US. K.S. Filioso is the author of The Wolf of Arniero, which is out now, and its sequel, The Ikasar Falcon, which is out later this month. Kay and Andrew will be talking today about everyday world building, the little bits that go in to make the world more realistic, not the big magic systems and things like that, uh, but details like food and transportation. They'll also be answering your questions throughout the event on that topic and other topics. I see a few of you have already entered questions using the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Keep them coming. You can also vote on your fellow audience members' questions so that the most popular questions get answered first. This event is being recorded and a replay will be available after it's over. If you aren't able to stay for the full event, you can watch that replay and you can also share it with your friends and followers using the same link you used to enter the event today. Follow Orbit Live on Crowdcast to be notified about upcoming events with more great authors. And now I'm very happy to turn the event over to Kay and Andrea. Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> um, so I kind of just wanted to kick off and uh, ask you, Kay, like what everyday world building means to you. I mean, I know um, when I read um, Wolf of Aranaro, it definitely felt like a very real place with all of the um, kingdoms and uh, the food. And then, I mean, mentioned was transportation. I know they were taking the ship to the other island. Um, but what kind of things do you think really make a place feel real to you? Like, what were you thinking about when you were writing that book? Um, I, I generally don't plan, like, how the world feels. I always start with character. And what I do is once a character's in a certain situation, I'm thinking of what they want, and the world kind of forms itself around that character. And by what they want, I. I think of them as someone who's like like an an actual person. So, including like, are they hungry? What time did they eat? Like, you know, if they have to walk somewhere, are they tired? And a lot of those things kind of play into how the character is responding to the plot events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it it's like there, there's a blank page, and then every time the character takes a walk, then you start to see the world kind of like form around that character. And so like one of the details I, I think we want, we were going to talk about is like the food. So yeah, yeah food is so important because like, I think for most of us, we're always constantly thinking about, you know, <laughs> when are we going to eat? Like, especially for Filipinos, this is, <laughs> This is a thing, like when we go camping, the number one question is, what are we going to eat? <laughs> My friends kind of make fun of me a little bit for that because when we all get together and we do like a writing retreat, I'm always like, well, what, what's our next meal? What are we, <laughs> what are we eating next? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, you know, we, we ate like an hour ago. What, what are we going to eat in two hours? <laughs> it's, yeah. It's so important, but like I, the, the good thing about food is it's just, it's not just food, but what it is, like what went into the food. So mm -hmm. what ingredients went into the food and how does that play a role in world building? So, you know, in, in the Wolf of Orignaro, being a, the, the Asian influence, there's a lot of rice. And yeah. n now you can discuss while eating rice, you can discuss the politics of rice. Where is that rice coming from? What kind of rice is it? You know, if if it's is it rich person's rice, which looks you know clean and polished, or is it more of the like the brown rice? Uh, you know, it 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 it's all so important. Like, how about in uh, your world building? Are yeah. there any recipes that <laughs> are? Well I mean, I definitely put um, a lot of like dumplings and steamed buns in there because I am so fond of them. And, you know, with my family, like that was one of the things that my mom taught me to make when I was little. It's like how to pleat dumplings and stuff. And she, you know, critique my pleats. And <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I feel like especially um, when 
food is really culturally important. Like they gather together with their families to eat. Um, I think that really does help to build out the world. And then also, you know, to take into account like what foods are available to them in their environment and during what seasons. And I mean, for my book, they, um, it takes place on a series of, of islands. So, uh, you know, every island kind of has their own like specialties just depending on what's grown there and what kind of things that they're fishing out of the ocean. Um, so I feel like that kind of adds uh, a lot to making a place feel like grounded and real. Cause I know like when I like travel places, like that's like the thing that I'm most focused on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is like what kind of foods do they have here? Like what's in their supermarkets and you know, what is the history behind that? Um, I mean, some places you'll go to and then you'll have a certain food and then you find out that it was, um, you know, originally imported from like some other place and then they've put their own spin on it. So yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel like to me it's an important, a very important part of like, everyday world building and making a place feel a lot more solid. I like how you said about like just the way they, they're eating the food. That's also another part of it, like not just the food itself, but the ritual around the mealtime where you know you have people gathering around and talking and maybe like how they how they eat is is so important like eat, the so for example if i have someone like break what they're eating and then offer it to their their friend it it kind of adds a layer to it where maybe i'm not saying that there's anything happening between those two but there's a connection you know mm -hmm. it's like it, 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 the the sharing itself the it's not just the, the thing happening, but it's telling you the mindset of the characters that they're so willing to, if they're willing to share food or they're not. Like, you know, it, in Filipino culture particularly, that's our greeting. Like if, if we see someone, it's like, have you eaten yet? And, and it's like the comfort of that person, the number one priority is food. You know, they come into our house and we make sure that they're, they've eaten. And then we, like when they're about to leave, we, we pack food for them. <laughs> It's <laughs> and it's it's like how they handle those things. It it tells you a lot about character and and world without like without exposition, mm -hmm. without yeah. without saying that oh this is how this culture is or or this person is starting to care about this other person. It's just it's more it's more subtle. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah. That's something that I have in my second book too. Where yeah. like the character is like, let me feed you. You know, yeah. it's like. <laughs> It's, it's kind of a show of like, uh, you know, that you care about the person and that you like want them to, to be fed and be well. So is there anything else that you kind of keep in mind when you're kind of building a scene in a place um, to try to make it feel a little bit more like it is a real place? Yeah, like... Uh so, so again, it comes back to character. So whatever that character cares about is something that they're going to like focus on. So, you know, none. So in Orinaro, it's, it was so easy because Italian, like being a queen would be interested in politics. So she's walking along and she's like, she's looking at the social, like what's happening in her surroundings, like her mm -hmm. social observations and then how that relates to politics. Whereas if it's another character where, say, if the character is a, a farmer, maybe they'll notice more like the like the the crops that are there, or, you know, the, how the marketplace is. So whatever that character cares about, then then that's the one that I'm going to expand on because it, it just it, it makes the world feel real without having to force the without having to force the world building into something where it, the character doesn't even care about that aspect of the world building, then it right, feels then kind of off, right? 
Yeah, it's like an author intrusion. It's like, oh, the author wants me to know this rather than it's the character that is actually like noticing or observing this thing. Yeah, and I think that's like one of the things that's really um, great to do as an author is trying to combine like aspects of um, world building and character. So when you have like the character observing these certain things, then you're building out like what they care about as well as fleshing out the world a little bit more. Yeah, because, uh, you know, characters are in world, I think, you know, we're, we're products of our environment. <laughs> and it's, I, I find it hard to separate the two mm -hmm. because, you know, we, how how we look at things is a product of the environment and then knowing the connection between those two is is so important to me for 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 it to feel real because otherwise if i try to take a character that doesn't belong in that world it just it feels off with it and then i don't know what that character wants and it it's not like the magic's not happening in that case <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think another thing that I try to keep in mind is, I don't know if you've ever like visited a place or been to a place and then you kind of, you know, you go back a lot later and then you have that kind of sense of memory and of knowing that place. And, and it's due to these like specific little things, like sometimes it's the way that a place like smells, like, you know, or um, the way that like maybe the door is a little bit creaky or it's just these things that kind of like spark your memory. Yeah. So I do try to think about like those little details um, that kind of just make a place feel like lived in, like that you've been there before maybe. Yeah, like <laughs> like just even just like a groove on on something because it's been used so long or like, like say a, a tree trunk is smooth because people have been like whole that touching it for so long it's just yeah, yeah. The, those little things that and it's the same thing like when you're building a scene sir instant pot sorry <laughs> ignore it <laughs> it's, it's just making a sound okay yeah i can not do that <laughs> Speaking of food. <laughs> so yeah, Sorry, like 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 when 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 you're building a scene and then you have them use their environment. So you know a character's drinking water, and then places the water where it's supposed to go. Like they're moving around. It's not just two like two heads talking to each other. You actually have them move and use the environment like they, they might push a chair they might do this it just it makes it feel more alive to have them be part of the environment as opposed to just having the environment like a separate thing yeah i feel like too like when you know what a place is like that you kind of have to put in like reminders a little bit once in a while as an author like you can say that oh it's raining but if you never remind the reader of that again then like they're gonna forget and then it will come up as a surprise later instead of feeling like it's something that's just affecting them so you kind of have to put in things like oh yeah like you know the windowsill's wet and you know their yeah. their clothes are dripping and <laughs> then that kind of just makes it feel a little bit more like oh yeah okay it is rainy yeah uh let's talk about transportation though i think <laughs> that was mentioned oh yeah transportation how do you deal with transportation and why uh, does it suck <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, it's like if you could just snap your fingers and have the characters be where they're supposed to be. <laughs> Although, I mean, it does serve its purpose as far as like world building goes. So, um, you know, your book has islands, mine has islands. Um, and yeah, they have to get from one place to another by sailing there. Um, mine, they migrate. So like there's the whole thing where people have to go to school to learn how to navigate their way between the islands because they move around a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to keep that in mind. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, 
not everybody can actually uh, like navigate their way between the islands. Although if they're like close together, they can do that. But yeah, there's like a lot of sailing and um, a lot of getting from one place to another in my book, which has to be dealt with because otherwise it does not feel real. <laughs> yeah. And, and especially in fantasy, I think there's a tradition of transportation. Each, <laughs> like dealing with horses and dealing with like going from like covering vast distances. Yes, like trying to figure out, well, how long would it actually take them to get from this place to the other place? Like what's realistic? I know there's, I always see complaints from horse people about the way that horses are treated in fantasy books. They're like, they're not cars, you know, I'm like, Oh. <laughs> get inside your horse and then drive <laughs> right right like you can't keep them at like a gallop yeah. or on cruise control right that doesn't really work that way yeah. yeah and with with ships it's like you can't just immediately get from one place to another either and especially if you're sailing like you kind of have to depend on the natural elements a little bit i i kind of like i, I when i can ignore transportation i will ignore it and I'll, I'll be like oh they're already there sometimes i can't just for pacing sake because it's like if you keep jumping around zipping around then you know you're having a hard time trying to connect the plot or something so what i tend to do is i take something from video games where i have party banter <laughs> <laughs> so i i know that you know maybe like two pages i'm gonna have transportation so while having the transportation, then there's going to be conversation happening. And oh, that's there's... good, yeah. <laughs> Steal that. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, took it, I took it from Dragon Age where, you know, you're, you're walking around and then suddenly they're like, they're talking. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. I love that in Dragon Age where your party members start interacting with each other and they're yeah. always saying like ridiculous stuff. It's, it's Honestly, I think, I think I played the game just for that. Like, like uh, once I remember my husband asking, why are you just walking around in circles? <laughs> 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 I'm trying to find a party banter. <laughs> So yeah, like transportation, I can, I can, I do that sometimes. Sometimes I make the transportation into actually part of the plot. So like they're supposed to be going somewhere and then something happens and that becomes part of the plot. So, so I guess trying to find a creative way to get them from point A to point B, but not actually ignoring that that has to happen. <laughs> so, yeah. So they're gonna talk about oh we're gonna go we're gonna get there we're gonna have to take these horses we're gonna have to take that road blah blah, blah. and then that doesn't actually happen <laughs> something else happens <laughs> the best laid plans right <laughs> fast travel unlocked <laughs> <laughs> should we take questions uh sure okay um let me see. How about this one? Um, what kind of research do you do and how long do you spend researching before beginning a book? Hmm. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I, I feel like as, as a, having been doing this all my life, basically my life is like a constant state of research. So having like specific interests that like like l loving how to read books about battles and stuff like that it's just it's like a separate interest but if i'm actually starting a book i don't actually research before i start a book <laughs> which is probably like a sin <laughs> uh well i commit the same sin then yeah <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't research before I start writing. I kind of think about the feel of a place and then I start writing. And then when I run into things that I know I'm going to need to research, I kind yeah. of like, I'll either, you know, if I absolutely need to, I'll sit down and like research it right then. But um, if I can kind of get away with like f fudging it a little, I'll do that and then just make a note to myself like, uh, check this thing here later. Like, is this actually 
<laughs> is this actually going to work? <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of handle it that way. I don't I don't spend time beforehand. Uh, as far as like how much time I spend during, oh, uh, I don't know. It depends on how much I'm trying to procrastinate, um, <laughs> or how like weird or interesting the thing is that I'm researching. Can I mean, kind that's of why, fall down that rabbit hole. That's why we write fantasy, so we don't have to research. Yeah, well, the, the bad thing about that I found out is that you still have to be consistent. Yeah. So if you're in there, like, making stuff up, like, oh, yeah, like, dragons have, like, a life cycle of, like, 20 years, then you have to, like, write that down somewhere because the next thing you know, you're going to be saying somewhere else that it's, like, 35 years and, oh, no. <laughs> I just, I, I'm so lazy that I just let, like, I, I write something in the manuscript and if it makes it to the final form, then that's canon. Anything yeah. before that is not canon, even if I write it down somewhere. <laughs> so it's, it's like a constant state of retcon. <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been keeping um, a wiki actually, which has been helpful because I'll forget like what somebody was named or who's friends with who or something, and I have to go and like look it up. So that's actually been um, helpful, but. Yeah, it's it's hard to keep track of everything when you're building a whole entire world. Do you want to choose another question? Sure. Uh, how about this? The Bone Shard Daughter has an emperor and the Wolf of Orinyaro has a queen. What do you think it says about the fantasy genre that the governments are so often monarch? monarchical is that something you considered when building your worlds um yeah i think like fantasy tends to gravitate towards like monarchies and like dictatorships in a way um i don't know exactly why that is i, I mean for me it was something that i was thinking about um because I mean, I don't want to like say too much about what happens in later books, but um, yeah, because the thing is like, you know, we so often see the stories where there's like a corrupt leader and then somebody comes in and like there's a battle and they defeat them. And then, you know, the good person is the ruler now and like, yay, everybody lives happily ever after kind of thing. But I don't think that's how it works in real life. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> that she made it. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, mine's like a sleepover there. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think like that—that that is something that I would like to see um, addressed more in, in fantasy books. Like kind of moving away from that maybe or like at least like exploring other forms and systems of government um but yeah i i think uh it was something i was thinking about but i did not move away from that in book one so yes <laughs> so so with mine i purposely chose to set this from the point of view of a queen kind of to directly criticize fantasy's obsession with it. And again, like the same with you, I don't want to talk too much about what happens in the later books, but it is very definitely a criticism because in the past I've, I've written fantasy books that are not about royalty. They're not even about important people. They're just kind of like on the side. And I felt like maybe the interest was not there compared to when I said that like I was gonna write about a queen, it's it's suddenly more interesting. And so yeah, like the the, the the whole series itself is kind of a criticism of the tropes that fantasy loves to use. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> oh, somebody says nods head as yeah. I'm reading Ikasar Falcon. Hmm. Hmm. 
I'm che- I'm, I'm I'm giving you the answers now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me see. Let's choose another question. Um, okay, so uh, how about this one? How do you manage to write morally gray characters and make them likable? Any tips? Hmm. I don't know about making them likable <laughs> because I know there's that not everybody likes all the characters. I think maybe the a better way to say is to make them to to show their struggles in a way that some people will be able to relate with them and I think that's the best way to approach morally gray characters is to not like just think of them as people making mistakes <laughs> you know it's it's not about trying to force them into like oh you know these are likable traits you know balancing balancing bad and good but more about making them real so if they're they're making morally great choices they're making bad choices why are they making those choices and it's not so much that everyone will be able to relate with them but somebody who might have been in the same situation will say oh yeah i would have made the exact same choice or I wouldn't have, but I can see why she made that choice. Yeah. I think like empathy is definitely key. Like being able to see a character's motivations and why they're making the choices that they do. I mean, honestly, I don't think that my characters are that morally gray. Uh, I'd say like, Hmm. I think um, they're all trying to do their best. <laughs> but uh, sometimes I think that that gets difficult insofar as like what does that mean as like if you're trying to um, do the best that you can and like make the best choices I mean not every choice is going to be uh, like this is the right answer and this is the wrong answer and I think that making it so the the reader understands like why the character is making the choice that they are. I mean, you, you've played Dragon Age. Like, I don't know if you've played Mass Effect, but sometimes yeah. like there there isn't like a right answer. Yeah. You're like, do you kill <laughs> like Ashley or do you kill Satan? Like, it's like there's not like a oh that one always has the right answer. <laughs> Well, according to some people, but it's, you know, it's like, I think that, I don't know if I would classify it as morally gray so much as, you know, sometimes there are no good answers and you kind of just have to um, make, you know, have your character choose the one that makes the most sense to them. Yeah. And not everybody's going to agree with that. Not everybody's going to yeah. say like, well, I think they made the right decision. Yeah. Um, they might say like, uh, I think you should have gone the other direction, <laughs> I mean, especially I th- depending on the repercussions, right? I think it's impossible to create a character that everyone will love, like universally. Yeah. Although some of them yeah. get pretty close. <laughs> so I'll I'll ask this one. Wait, how do you find the balance between? Mysterious and defined magic. Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. Hmm. Is there a balance though? Like, I mean, I kind of feel like you can go in either direction, just depending. Um, like for my book, there is some very defined magic yeah. and then there's some very mysterious magic. Uh, and Sometimes I feel like the mysterious magic can have a process of discovery as far as like you can figure out, well, how is this power working and why later? But sometimes I think that it's nice to just leave it that way. Like sometimes magic is just magic. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's a certain appeal also to very like defined magic. I, I mean, there's, 
the bone shard magic in my books, which is very like much like um, computer programming in a way. It's like a logic yeah. puzzle. Yeah. And I find that to be its own thing that's also enjoyable. So I don't know if there's like a balance so much as like, I feel like they each have their own merits. And I think that you can find something that is, uh, that works on like any end of that spectrum, really. Yeah, for me, it's it's always, it depends on what the story needs. If the story needs a problem that has to be solved with magic, then I start to really explain the rules based on what that the the viewpoint character understands. That's kind of my cheat. I don't like I wouldn't know how that magic actually works, but this character is explaining it this way <laughs> based on their understanding. So I guess that's the balance for me. Like it it there, there's this the sense of uh the unreliable narrator or you know this is somebody who didn't study very well if it was a mage talking this is somebody who's not a very good mage so mm -hmm. the way they're explaining it might seem defined but it's still kind of mysterious because they actually made a mistake mm -hmm. so it, it depends on what the story needs and it's not so much that i care about the actual like having the actual logistics of the magic because i i feel like it's it's gonna bore me <laughs> <laughs> yeah like but but i do use enough definition that it makes sense if the problem needs to be solved through magic yeah because i feel like magic should still have some sort of cost yeah. um just you know conservation of energy kind of yeah stuff, yeah right? <laughs> yeah like just the basics right it's it's hard to just have magic where you're like okay i have food now <laughs> yeah yeah somebody's just out there willy-nilly being like mm, i did this because of magic and it's like oh you kind of have to have like some limitations yeah. otherwise it starts to get a little bit Mm. <laughs> you're writing a comedy and you're not writing a <laughs> fantasy like, novel at the very least have an mp bar <laughs> yeah right right like where is that power coming from and yeah you know you you're draining it somehow so. and is the magic user like any good how's their skill <laughs> yeah yeah like you can't just I mean, sometimes they just like pick it up right naturally. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I think it just kind of depends. Like, I think it depends on what your goals are in the story. Oh, is it my turn to pick out? Yes. Okay. Oh, ooh, okay. Let me see. Um, hmm. Do you have an example of in depth research or world building you did that did not? end up being used on the page? Huh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I said I didn't do research. <laughs> uh, mm, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think, I can't think of anything in particular. I know like I did a lot of, like I picked up a lot of like travel guides things and I made notes of stuff that I thought was interesting but I can't really recall anything specific right now uh there's stuff that I did use like there's um mm, but like it doesn't really come up as a thing like um so I have like the navigators that they get like a, a, a tattoo on their wrist so they can identify their bodies and stuff if they float up on shore um and then i thought about it and i was like well how long does it take for a body to decay in the ocean and like would it be eaten and i like had to go and like look that stuff up and it's like oh like, yeah like it actually takes some time so i'm like okay cool that works <laughs> so I mean, there's stuff like that where I don't actually have in the book, like, this is how long yeah. that a body takes to decay in the ocean. <laughs> Speaking of bodies, yeah, that's probably like a good bulk of my research on how, you know, where can you stab someone and it doesn't kill them? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think the writers have very interesting Google searches. Yeah, how much blood can you lose? And, yeah. 
<laughs> without getting a transfusion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was like one of the things I was looking up a lot too is about like um, the trepanning, like, you know, the, where they take a piece of the skull and it's like, oh, can they do that? And can they, people still live after that? And like, cause it, it was very important to me that they'd still be alive so that they could use their life force as a source of that, the magic. So I found myself doing a lot of research about that and apparently like yeah you, it's, people used to do it in like prehistoric times <laughs> and then they uh, would see that like some of the bone was starting to grow back so they realized oh. that these people had like lived through these procedures oh like, god <laughs> it's horrifying <laughs> it is pretty horrifying yeah yes. speaking of horrifying I caught something caught my eye here why did you both decide to blend horror elements into your novels? Okay, well, <laughs> um, so for me, I've always kind of been fascinated with the idea of using like some sort of body part for magic, um, as well as that intrinsic horror of like being consumed in some way. So I, I, so I really kind of wanted to have that in my book. I mean, the whole idea started with the bone shard magic to begin with. Um, so I knew I wanted it to be like a little bit like weird and creepy, uh, especially since, you know, they have these constructs that they're putting together from parts of dead animals and then bringing to life. So it's a little <laughs> bit of like necromancy there yeah. too. I'm like, well, what kind of like creepy, weird creatures can I make out of that? So that was kind of fun to to do. Because um, I was thinking if you're actually like taking apart animals and putting them together in different configurations, you're probably trying to look for some sorts of like specializations. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, for me, like I've always been kind of attracted to some of the kind of horrific elements of that. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't consider my book like grimdark, but like I think that it's definitely um, got a shiny black veneer on it. So, uh, for me, horror is very, very much part of Filipino mythology. So there's a lot of like, like the aswang, which is kind of like a ghoul, like a like a blood sucking shape shifting thing and i like using that means that naturally there's a lot of horror and like th there's that and there's also the fact that as a genre I, I do love horror especially horror movies and i love i just love the atmosphere in a lot of those movies and i wanted to use that same feeling of dread every time there's there's something happening like i wanted that same bone chilling uh you know feel which is why i think like just having those two i i, I w was a big influence in how i started writing the series and it's not i don't know if i could say it's on purpose but it's just like it's something that fascinates me and i love using it as as tension instead of you know instead of just having all out action. So action to me is actually more of a relief of that tension. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's 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 mostly that I I I I love the the elements used. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was my mom and she's probably gonna call again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll ask uh, this one. Oh, how many books will be in your respective series? Do you know for yours? Three. Three, <laughs> yeah. Uh, three for mine too, so <laughs> the trilogy. Um, well, that one was easy. Uh, let me, <laughs> um, let me ask it another one. <laughs> Um, 
Uh, both of your books have an Asian influence to them. Where did you draw inspiration and what other books do you recommend? Hmm. I would say that my Asian influence is coming from myself. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah like there are some tropes that appear in both anime and jrpgs just because that's what i grew up on particularly like, like anime is what was so big when i was growing up in the philippines it's just it is all we talked about it's you know and a lot of that storytelling basically became part of our culture and you know, learn like, like when I started writing, I naturally gravitated to, towards that storytelling, even though I've been reading like fantasy novels set in the West, but it's like my heart and soul is more <laughs> into the JRPG and the anime influence. So it, so we, I, I used that and then I used Filipino culture as I know it. And, and it kind of formed this whatever, <laughs> whatever world I have right now. Yeah, and I, I, I'm still uh, like, I'm still inspired by a lot of the, that stuff. I don't know, other books, I'm gonna recommend Andrea's book, <laughs> which is right there, you can see it. Yeah. Oh, oh neat. <laughs> oh, the cat just jumped. <laughs> That's funny because like I always recommend your book too. Yeah. <laughs> We're making this so easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, for inspiration, uh, yeah, a lot of it is just uh, for my family and how I grew up. Um, I'm you know Chinese and then I'm also Scottish, um, but I grew up mostly like around my mom's side of the family. Um, so, and then my mom's immigrated from China, um, and yeah, it's just, it's like, it's, it's definitely like different than the way that my husband grew up. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think, I, I think a lot about that, like just the sense of values and family and, you know, that kind of. Um, duty to your family and, and especially to like your parents and their expectations like that was like a big backbone of like my upbringing. Um, yeah, like I would always be so surprised by like how people, like, some of my friends would like talk to their parents and stuff. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I kind of I drew a lot on that and then obviously like um the food and just the way that um i was taught with that um i drew a little bit too from um i've been to thailand and i knew i wanted to have it set in kind of a more tropical kind of um geography uh so there is like the dry season and the wet season as opposed to like um you know winter fall spring summer um, and I read some like travel guides to other places in Asia just to get like a sense of some of like history and, um, their food and things like that, um, and their mythologies and, but a lot of it, like most of it was just my upbringing that I kind of just put a little bit here and there <laughs> as far as other books yeah um i definitely like always like recommend uh Kay's book I'm like it's great um i also really enjoyed uh jade city um that is a really uh wonderful um also like asian setting book um it's a trilogy the third one uh, just came out and then um, there was an announcement too, they're working on a television series. So yeah. that's, exciting. that's exciting. Yes, I know. It's like, it's so great to see like more like Asian people on the screen. <laughs> it's just like been not that many. I know when I was growing up, I like the first fantasy stuff that I wrote was actually like 
you know, the straight white farm boys. Cause that's all that I was reading. That's all that I thought there was. Yeah. So I, yeah. I wrote, I wrote about animals mostly because <laughs> I thought that at least that was acceptable. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. I did that too. That was like the first manuscript I ever wrote when I was a kid. It was like, I don't know how to deal with people. So there are animals. <laughs> I used to do a uh, watership down fan fiction, oh. which I have removed online. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> when I got when I got my publishing deal, I'm like, oh crap, that thing's still online. <laughs> oh, I I watership down with like, I read that book ragged. I still have my copy that I picked up at a yard sale when I was a kid. It, the cover is gone, but yeah, yeah. I have three copies of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I should have done. Yeah. Is it my turn or? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of really good questions. I know. Let's go at a more general one. How do you build politics into your world? Hmm. How do you build politics into your world? Um, well, I mean, in mine, there's, you know, there's an emperor and there's governors of these islands and they don't always agree with the emperor. I kind of feel like politics are just an extension of like human relationships, you know, like, it's like, what do these people want and why do they want it? And, you know, how does that affect how they interact with other people? And when you get to politics, it just becomes broader instead of like closer and more personal. So, you know, the emperor may have like uh, certain powers over these people and has to decide like which levers to kind of pull and push depending on what he wants out of them. Um, and I kind of feel like that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I also like have the brewing revolution, which is I think, you know, pretty political too. Like what do you tell people your goals are? Like what do you tell them they're gonna get out of joining your revolution? And like, why should they risk everything in order to try to overthrow the world order? Like, are like, is it that bad? Um, and what are they losing if they don't join you? So, yeah, I think it's just kind of like an extension of the human relationships in the world. Yeah, like I, I look at, I take a lot of inspiration from real life i've i've actually like i used to watch senate meetings in the in the philippines and it's it's pretty much how a lot of like the political arguments in my books sometimes play out <laughs> where they're just like throwing insults at each other mm -hmm. so like the way i think of politics is just a lot of jerks in charge <laughs> and, <laughs> And you can just go to town with that. It's because you know, in my, my world, like in The Wolf of Orinyaru, you actually just see a small part of it. But I've written novels all across that continent and there, there are patterns and the pattern is it's always a jerk in power. And then, you know, you can explore whether it's the power that they made that person a jerk or the other way around or... Well, I think like, it's also hard to not be a jerk when you're in power as far as like, you know, you can't please everybody. And so yeah. you're always going to be pissing somebody off. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you get like all of that power, pe some people are going to be like, well, I need you to do this for me. And other people are going to say, well, I need you to do this for me. And then you may choose one group and the other group's like, well, you're a jerk now, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's, it, I feel like. It's it's like what epic fantasy really revolves around. In. <laughs> it's jerks in power. Yes. <laughs> it's like, very true. Okay, let me see. Is that it's my turn, right? 
Yes. Oh, I like this one. What's a trope you have not written yet, but would love to write in the future? Oh, <laughs> what haven't I written yet? Because I, I, I love just doing all of them. <laughs> yeah, because I think Oriana has the thief trope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that. But I'm just going to say all of them. <laughs> Uh, I think the trope that I really enjoy that I have not written yet, and I don't know if there's ever going to be a real opportunity, is like the whole, there's only one bed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just think it's like, it's so funny and it's like so awkward. And uh, every time I read it in a book, it always makes me giggle because, you know, you know that like, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but the author makes it make sense and then you're just thinking about how awkward it is and all the implications and yeah so that that's one that i've not written yet i've not written that but uh i keep thinking about that and it's like what what will make the floor not a not a good option <laughs> Right. To be like some, there's something wrong with the floor. You have to, you have to have like, you have to kind of finagle your way into it, and I have not figured out a way to do that. Yeah. But it's so fun when it does happen. When an author pulls it off, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> okay. Uh... Okay, if if your MCs met each other, would they hang out or what would they think of each other? <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Uh, I think it depends on which of my main characters. Like if it were if it was Lynn and Tally and I don't know. I think they'd I, mean, I don't <laughs> think they'd like each other. They'd probably murder each other, yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, I think Tanya <laughs> might get along okay with Jovis just because he's kind of, you know, he knows how to make himself seem pretty harmless, although he could be obnoxious. I don't know. She might not like that either. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's generally nice until, you know, until she has a reason not to be nice, and then she yeah. just goes... <laughs> I don't think she's, I don't think she's like indiscriminately violent. Yeah. But, <laughs> she yeah, could have I, been way more violent in the first book. <laughs> I definitely feel like her and Lynn would butt heads. I don't think they like each other very much. Unless there's a problem that they can like both like solve together. Instead of like, and then you know, suddenly like the whole world will just like explode because now they're working together. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see here. Let's pick out another question. Oh, what's, um, well, let's leave that one just a little bit later. Um, oh, is there any part of world building that is the bane of your existence? Mine would be figuring out exact years. Um, I knew the answer to this, like when I was writing. <laughs> uh, yeah, anything that has to do with details, like technical technical details that I have to remember. I don't like remembering things. Yeah. Like so so like the, the earlier we were talking about like the dragon's lifespan is 20 years and I'm never going to remember that if I write that in the background. So I have to make sure that it appears in the manuscript in such a way that I re retain the information that I learn it. And then and then it's just part of my canon. Like, it's just part of how I think of this world. Like, oh, dragons live this long. Or, you know, I, I think with my dragons, they have to they have to absorb enough air to actually, like, release fire. And I remember that because it was important in Ikesar Falcon, I think. And, it, yeah, it's, it's stuff like that. Like, the more books I write, the more concerned I am that I'm going to forget something. And then, you know... It's just gonna punch me in the face when when this book's released, and I'm like, they're like, you know, that this is inconsistent with what you said a while back. 
but yeah. there's no way for me to remember. <laughs> it's like when you write enough books, that's when you start like the George R. R. Martin way, right? You get like a secretary or somebody that like keeps track of it for you. My, my husband kind of does something like that where, and he's, he's called me a few times where he's like, you know, you had this character doing this, but you know, th this happened. I'm like, how do you remember that? <laughs> that was like four books ago. <laughs> Yeah, my my sister when she reads my my stuff, she's actually really good about pointing out inconsistencies, which I'm terrible with as well. Like for for me, like the world building thing, like um, the biggest thing that I always have to go back and fix is uh, like where everything is located. So I I'm terrible. Like I I start out without a map and I just write. And I'm like, I don't know. This thing is like Northwest or Northeast or something. <laughs> and then when I go back and like do revisions, that's when I realize like I have no idea where anything is. So I have to like draw like a, a vague map, which is usually just like circles and arrows. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember like after, so I, I did that. I did like my whole circles and arrows map and then you know, um, Orbit was like, oh, like, do you want to put a map in the book? And I was like, oh, actually, I love maps and books. And I think that'd be a really good idea. Um, and then I had to like go in and like take my circles and arrows thing and like make it actually like a little bit more understandable. So I think like, for me, it's like just knowing where everything is located and how far apart they are. That's, uh, yeah, the worst. <laughs> I actually, I really love that part of when you're doing copy edits and they have like the timeline. And I, I love seeing like the dates, like they, they think they give arbitrary dates where it's like, oh, it's summer. So June something, this happened. And then, you know, two days later, say June 12th, this happened. <laughs> I yeah. love that because it's just, it, it helps you go like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about the editing process is the style sheet from the copy editor yeah. where it's got like all the characters and, you know, just like little things about consistency. But it also made me realize like how inconsistent I was being. <laughs> I'm like, oh dear. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes like I have a note from the copy editor with like a query and I'm just like, yes, <laughs> that was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> We're supposed to be masters of our own worlds and yet. <laughs> I feel like this whole <laughs> this whole conversation we're just admitting to the things we don't do. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we have time for okay. Oh, yeah. should we no. uh, cover the orbit questions? Hmm. Like what's a book you recently read and enjoyed? I am reading Fires of Vengeance with uh, by Evan Winter right now, and I'm loving Ooh. it. <laughs> I'm excited for that one. Yeah, I, I haven't actually been reading a lot since the pandemic. I've been writing a lot, but now I'm finished with those books that I was writing, so <laughs> I'm back to reading now. <laughs> yeah, for me, um... I usually read really quickly, but it's been um, it's been really slow lately. So I've been kind of like working through uh, a couple of books. Um, let me see. Recently, uh, I did read um, the third book in Megan O'Keefe's Protectorate series, uh, which is like not out yet. The second one just came out. But I can assuredly say that she sticks the landing. So definitely pick up that series. That was super fun. Um, so it starts with Velocity Weapon and there's Chaos Vector. And the third one is Catalyst Gate, um, which I had the good fortune of reading early and it's fantastic. I love it. So yeah, if you're afraid that it's not gonna end well, don't be afraid. It's great. I need to pick that one up. I haven't read a lot of uh, science fiction, but I'd love to, you know, just start reading more science fiction. I think it's a good one to yeah. do that with because it's not like, it's not 
like inaccessible. It's very quite accessible. Like, you know, it's not like the super hard sci-fi or anything. It's space opera. Um, so I think yeah. it has like a lot of the same similarities to like epic fantasy or just, you know, in yeah. space. Yeah, like I, after I played Mass Effect, I was like, you know, maybe I should read more sci-fi. And then I picked up a couple of classics, I'm not gonna say the names, but <laughs> they kind of turned me off because, you know, sexist and, you know, yeah. I, think, I think I ranted for quite a bit and then I just, I kind of gave up, up on it, but I feel like- Yeah, the, the classics, yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> That yeah. was the wrong, the wrong decision. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, should we answer one more or? Yeah. About maybe what's next? Sure. So, yeah. So, oh, do you want to go? I read the last one. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, what's out next? It's the AKSR Falcon, which is in two weeks. And then book three is gonna be out next year in May. So it's almost done. <laughs> That's a quick release schedule. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Um, so what's next for me? Well, my book just came out today. Ah, super excited. Um, and I am revising book two currently. So the draft is done and I'm just trying to make it pretty <laughs> so <laughs> so i don't feel terrible when i hand it into my editor um so yeah i don't have a release date for that yet uh but i do plan on handing it in on time um like i said it is finished so i just need you, to, you have to say that because they're watching this <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> I was, you know, it's 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 been a little bit tough. Um, just, I mean, I usually write like actually way faster than this. Um, but you know, I'm I'm uh, having a baby in a couple weeks, so that's a good excuse. <laughs> the whole um, being pregnant thing has been uh, yeah. a little bit more of a challenge, but um, but yeah, no, the book is 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 drafted i'm just like going back and like making it make sense and like fixing some consistency things and making the arcs arkier <laughs> so, yeah so this has been a lot of fun <laughs> congratulations on the release of the bone shard daughter <laughs> Oh, thank you, and I'm I'm so looking forward to the Kazar yeah. Falcon because I've been like yelling at everybody to go read like Wolf of Oranyaro. I'm like, ah, oh, uh, it's fantastic. I, so I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank okay. you everyone for coming. Thank you. And it's been great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, till next time. Bye.